Good morning. Today is March 7th, um, and good evening for those of you in Tanzania. This is QHSC first training meeting, ICU, hosted by Dr. Gwen Randall and Dr. Map A. Saeed. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Those of you who are just coming in, if in the chat you could put your email and the name of your hospital, that way um, we can send little certificates to you for joining the meeting later on this week. I am going to go ahead and share the screen. Take it away. <laughs> okay, so good morning from Tanzania. It's evening here. So good morning for those in the USA. So today we are going to, my name is Dr. Mafe Saidi, a medical doctor from the Department of Anastasia in Mohindiri National Hospital. Uh, along with Dr. Gwendolyn Rando from USA. I hope you can all hear me well. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Okay, so I will start the presentation and Dr. Rando, Gwen Rando will be a very good facilitator and supervisor. So our main objective <clears throat> at the end of this presentation or session for the participants is for them to be able to describe airway, anatomy, and the physiology, to discuss <clears throat> routine airway management, which will include the basic and advanced airway management, and also we will demonstrate uh, on airway assessment, especially for anesthesia and the elective cases that you are going to manage. And also to identify airway equipment, the equipment which you are going to need when you want to do an airway or you want to help someone with difficult airway or difficult breathing. Also, we discuss different techniques that you might use for airway management depending on the situation, depending on the age, depending on the physical style of occupation. So, the overview. <coughs> Expert airway management is an essential skill in medical practice. Whenever you're a medical professional, you are working in ICU, uh, operating theaters, you are in the ward, you are in the emergency department. In some way or somehow, you will find that yourself. You find a patient who has difficult breathing or difficult airway obstruction. So you need to help that patient to avoid brain damage to avoid death. So if you have uh, skills and knowledge of airway management, it will help you to help that patient. So this includes maneuvers and medical procedures performed to prevent airway <clears throat> problem or prevent uh, brain damage from hypoxia and to relieve airway obstruction. Okay, uh, finally, um, different studies, especially this one done by Cook and others in 2012, it has shown that complications and failure of airway management, comparing all cases and anesthesia. As you can see from the uh, from the diagram or illustration here, blue for all cases and it's green for anesthesia. So as you can see. The main picker of failing intubation has accounted for complication and failure, mostly, especially on all cases compared to other cases. So, followed by aspiration of the gastric function. These are some of the complications that you might face while managing patient's airway or having patient with airway obstruction. Along with those, there are also extubation related problems can't intubate and can't ventilate, uh, tracheostomy related problems, endotracheal tube misplacement, obstruction of the tube. That might all cause problems, especially brain damage due to hypoxia or many death to the patient. So I this was just uh, this, yes? I think one of the important things is when people as you can see here from the, all the cases, the failed intubation and then the tube misplacement, 
The bottom line is, if you don't see it, if you don't have end tidal CO2, if you don't have a rise and equal rise and fall of the chest, then the patient's not intubated and you cannot proceed. So, so many times you think you get the tube in and basically you're in the esophagus and then the patient dies. So it's very important if you're not sure to, if you can ventilate the patient, you can ventilate the patient, then, you know, you still have time. A lot of times people want to hurry up and get somebody intubated, but that's not necessarily the way it is. Okay. So just making sure that you have all those parameters prior to saying that the patient's intubated. As we said in our objective, we want to understand a little bit on airway anatomy and the physiology. So regarding anatomy, airway we consider it having an upper airway tract and a lower airway tract. So in the upper airway tract, we have the nose, the mouth, the pharynx, and the larynx. So in part of the nose, you can use, when you, you inhale, the uh, oxygen may pass through the nose or the mouth. But at the end, they will all come together into the pharynx. So the pharynx might have the nasal pharynx from the nose and the oral pharynx from the mouth or oral passage. Then you have the hypopharynx part, and uh, which will, will, will hit the glottis, <coughs> which cover the glottis. Which is uh, these are very important landmarks when it comes to airway management, especially the advanced airway management. And also, we need the larynx, that's the larynx, with nine cartilage, simply by uh, mentioning them the thyroid, the cricoid, the epiglottic, arachnoid, uh, coniclate, and cuneiform. And also, we have the thyroid, which will make up the conus elasticus, which appears as the vocal cord. These are important landmarks, especially when you manage our patients in advanced airway management when you want to intubate. The patient. These are very, very uh, useful landmarks to, to, to be sure that I'm putting my tube the right uh, side. So, next slide. So, here is uh, just an uh, <clears throat> illustration of the how you can see the, the, the airway anatomy. And you have a tongue, you have a head palate on it, and the top palate just the inner teeth. The nasal pharynx coming from the nose, the oral pharynx coming from the mouth. But they all go to hypopharynx, whereby we have a, 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 a modification of the esophagus and the trachea. Here now the important part, because sometimes, as we saw, we saw in the last slide, gas, aspiration of gastric content is one of the complications during our energy. And this is contributed to this very close anatomy of the esophagus and the trachea. And the epiglottis in our patients tend to prevent uh, this catastrophic complication. So the vocal cords enter the larynx in the first part of the trachea, going down in the lower tract, uh, airway tract. So along going with the anatomy, also this area are supplied by nails. And they are very, very, very sensitive, especially when the patient is not paralyzed. The glossopharyngeal nerve, the vagus nerve, arterial laryngeal nerve, internal laryngeal, and the recurrent laryngeal. These all contribute to what is called the airway protective system, which are involuntarily controlled or regulated. That's why. You might face difficulties if you want to intubate or you want to use LMA in your awake fashion. These reflexes will not allow it. And also, about the, the blood supply, this area is supplied by external carotid cavity and the internal fibular vein. So, <clears throat> steps to follow when you inhale uh, from the nostrils or the mouth. <laughs> the next slide. So this part of the nostrils and mouth, we have a, a special physiology and anatomy that will help you in warming and humidifying and filtering the air that you inhale. 
So this is like a first step in a prevention of most of the problems, especially when you inhale uh, particles. They will be filtered in the north due to the presence of these cilia like structures. Humidification, because the north is, uh, has a lot of light supply and the uh, venous uh, veins. So they will help in warming and humidifying the air so that you did not inhale the dry air. Entering the pharynx, now you can go to nasopharynx, oropharynx, or hypopharynx, as we say. And from the hypopharynx, you go to the larynx. Where in this area you find most of the pressure receptors that are responsible for airway protective reflex. That you call in your response to inhaling particles. If you want to pass anything other than air through the, 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 the air or the vocal cords, you might still get reflex, um, swallowing reflex, and things like that. And sometimes it might cause a response in response to or anybody to entering from the structure. So the next slide. So here now we are going to the, down to the lower airway chart. So it will, it will, it will uh, distribute itself uh, in a autonomous way. That means from the trachea, you're going to have two branches, which are called the bronchi. So the left and the right. And in the left, they are going to divide more into bronchioles. And in the bronchioles, it's going to divide into alveolar and alveolar stuff, and the alveolar where the uh, external gesture system will take place here. Delivering oxygen and take out carbon dioxide, which has been produced from the cells or tissues. So, this is the old part of the air that uh, the airway tract that uh, when you inhale the air pass, and when you exhale the carbon dioxide, will pass along in the opposite direction up to your nose, of which goes to so, uh, routine airway energy. So routine airway management will include a basic airway management, whereby this is non-invasive, it's quick, simple to perform, and the most implied in the safety age. Because it includes head and neck maneuvers, abdominal thrust, or back to blow. So you will find somehow uh, somewhere there's a problem with the airway, maybe outside the hospital, in the beach, uh, in the church, in the mosque, in the bus station, you don't have most of the equipment to help. So you will apply basic airway management to a bus. Very simple to perform. Our next slide, quick airway uh, management. It's in control. You might do uh, airway management to prevent obstruction or to remove or to relieve obstruction. So when a patient with the risk of having airway obstruction, I will apply this airway management to prevent the obstruction. And these include like a head and tilt or chin lifting, jaw thrust, or putting someone in the recovery position. But if you want to treat that means someone has already had problems with the airway, maybe for anybody in the airway. So we will think like encouraging to cough so as to, to get out the obstruction or doing back slap abdominal thrust, or hand leech maneuvers, and any children, they also are by to head down position. And this, but this will not be applicable. Very obvious fashion or in pregnant. So we will see some of the pictures we will uh, show how uh, we are supposed to do these uh, procedures or maneuvers, which are very simple and non invasive And next is this is uh, so if you if you, if you find someone lying on the ground and responsive, we encourage you also to call for help. Meanwhile, you want to open the airway with that person. How are you going to do so? By chin lifting or your thrust. Now we have to assess. If, if these patients are having a normal breath. Look for the chest movement, listen to the victim mouth for breath, breathing sounds, or you have to feel the air on your cheek. So if someone is not uh, breathing or has a normal breath, 
Now you have a different uh, response as you can see uh, in the next slide. If I have unconscious victim and breathing, he is breathing but unconscious. Place him in a recovery position. Now, as we can see from the other picture, uh, on the side is the left side. You lie the patient to the lateral side, helping the, uh, the right arm down to the cheek and the right uh, leg flexed a little bit as shown in the picture. So in this position, you are sure, first of all, the tongue is not falling back so that's the airway. And if the patient produces a lot of secretion, they will not go into the esophagus, uh, they will not go into the trachea. So the patient will be also free from the obstruction in this position. So this position is called the uncovered position. And you can also see the pictorial uh, presentation of the tongue position when you put the patient in the covered position. So before recovery position, the tongue is obstructing the airway, but in the recovery position, the tongue is allowing the, keeping the airway patent. The tongue is not falling to obstruct the airway. The next slide. So now we show the correct position of doing the head tilt with chin lifting maneuver and the jaw thrust. So this maneuver is also advised to when you are sure your patient has no cervical spine injury. Because if the patient has cervical spinal injury, you might find yourself injuring more the patient. So if you're sure my patient has no areas to buy for spinal injury, head tilt or chin lifting will help to relieve obstruction from the tongue to obstruct the pharyngeal part. And the jaw thrust to allow the patient for the patent airway. And if there are secretions that are in the mouth, the patient will be easy to be swallowed rather than going to the trachea. And now the, 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 the right uh, picture show how we put the, the, the baby uh, in a head down position and they're applying back slap on top of it. So the next slide to show uh, abdominal thrust and back slap, the next slide. You encourage the patient to cough or you encourage someone to cough or victim to cough. So just by coughing, you might find that the obstruction gets out. But if not, now you have to deliver five back slaps two times between the shoulder blades. And you position the patient uh, like this. And another way of relieving obstruction is by applying hand-reach maneuver. If it's still not breathing, keep a normal thrust. And this is done five to six. You sit on the behind uh, of the victim and you apply your, your, your forearms, making a thrust or applying pressure to the abdomen so as to push out the obstruction. And this is done five to six times. Okay? To uh, advance the airway relating, whereby these are the ones that rely on the use of medical treatment. They are impassive and they require expertise. And this can be done blindly or by radio visualization, by laryngoscopes or video laryngoscopes. And this is for critically injured pulmonary disease or anesthetized fashion. So it is done in a controlled environment. And the aim is to facilitate oxygenation and mechanical oxygen. And they require use of hypoglotic device, hypoglotic device. Or sometimes it's a surgical method to control the airway. Some other patients uh, who can talk, no abnormal airway sounds, the airway patent, uh, you are sure that this patient's airway is sure. The patient is breathing on there spontaneously. But when the patient is unconscious, always make doubt of the patient's airway. When a victim or someone is uh, unconscious, always make a doubt about the patterns of the hair. So what you, uh, the approach is different. Now I will look at the chest movement. 
if someone is breathing or there is a wake of sleep. If you have increased weight of breathing, use your palpitatory muscles, listen to the breath sounds, and if you hear snoring or gargling, or no breath at all, no breathing at all. Now you start to worry about the patterns of the airway. So before going too deep to airway access, uh, uh, go deep to the airway, advanced airway meaning, we will check on the airway assessment <coughs> on different locations, especially for panic cases. If you are going uh, to, 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 to give the to patient, especially for a there are ways of uh, anti or predicting or anticipating that I might face a difficult airway. Now, these are the tests that are uh, done. Next slide, Bree. Next slide. For example, you're doing a aesthetic airway assessment, like you, you check about the mouth, uh, ability to open the mouth or, uh, or opening, malam particle classification, upper lip slicing, grading of religion view, uh, or the commercial hand grading, and uh, checking the thyromental distance of the patient's anatomy, the neck form and neck mobility. That will help you to anticipate your force in that I might get it. So in mouth opening, you only start the patient uh, to insert three fingers to uh, the mouth. So it is a symmetric dance. One finger has almost two centimeters. So allowing three fingers uh, to enter the mouth, that we are sure that the oral opening is adequate. It's almost six centimeters there. So when you, 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 you do advanced airway management, if you want to insert the LMA or you want to insert the for intubation, you are sure you're not going to face difficulty because the oral opening is added. Also, phenomenal distance, which shows of the discussion of the air. You take a, a measurement, you can also use a finger bridge of, uh, from the mental or the, the mind, making your. So, in Again, also in hyalometric distance. Now, this time is not measured from the highest point to the So, here we want it to be. Another test done is malam like what you see here in the, <coughs> in the picture. Now you have four different patients, which I will talk to patients in a sitting position to open the mouth um, uh, wide and sometimes to take the tongue out. So I am looking to the oral cavity. What I see, my predictor uh, that I'm going to have a difficult time uh, is so in the class one, the structure that you see, you see the tongue, of uh, you see the tongue, I saw the hard palate, the soft palate, the whole part of the open. The back there, what I saw is the calcium pillars of the tonsils. All structures are visible. Now coming to class three, you start to lose some of the structure in your visualization. You saw the tongue, the hard palate, there's minimal visualization of the soft palate. The posterior pillars of the tonsils, now they start to disappear. And the uvula is not similar the way it is the class one. So class one and class two, it's easy to intubate. Mm. That's why we see. Going to class three now, I don't see the, uh, the tip of the uvula, only the base. The hard palate, I don't, the soft palate, I don't see only the hard palate, I see the calcium I don't see. And in class four, I don't see the ovula, only the tongue, the hard palate. So class three and class four are considered that this is, you anticipate your four, the difficultness of intubating this patient. Uh, next, uh, you might suggest your upper lip by so in upper lip bite test, you will start the patient down with you. To bite uh, how, his or her own upper lip. So as you can see now, 
class one patient is able to buy the upper class two patient has a marginal somehow difficult uh, compared to their they're going to face a difficult situation so I should be prepared. Uh, next slide. Another way of uh, uh, testing is by range. Of course, you will do the range review already. That means here you do the laryngoscopy, whether by video or uh, a direct one. How you see the laryngeal structures during laryngoscopy. So in grade one, also called the comatose hand ready. So in grade one, we can all appreciate the glottis and the vocal cords. And the uh, vocal cords or the, uh, the orifice is visible <coughs> very well. So here, it's easy to intubate because you can see the vocal cords and the <coughs> opening to the trachea. But in grade three, now we can see the, the, the glottis. But the orifice now has been reduced. We can appreciate the structures like the vocal cord and noise, but the, 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 the orifice now is a bit low, uh, small compared to the grade one. And in grade three, you can appreciate the epiglottis, but you cannot see the vocal cord. So, uh, in experienced personnel, they can use this lens to be able to intubate with the assistance of the introducers like stillage or bougie. And coming to grade four, it's somehow difficult. You cannot appreciate the laryngeal structure as well. So you are not sure if the tube is going in the right direction. So in these grade, grade three and grade four, you might you, you will face difficulties while intubating this because you don't see your, your tube going in to the trachea. So you might be going somewhere else, and you might find that your tube is in the esophagus and not in the trachea. Uh, next slide. I would just like to add something in terms of the um, assessment, and it's something called the LEMON, L-E-M-O-N, airway assessment. So the L is for, you kind of take a look externally. Does the patient have any facial trauma? Do they have huge incisors? What about a beard? Because beard, patients that have a large beard always present a problem. And then you also want to make sure and look at the tongue. The E is for like um, to evaluate what Dr. Mappy just talked about, looking at the incisors and also the thyroid mental distance and all of that. The M is for like the Malin Potty score. So we have scores of one to four. The O is checking for any kind of obstruction that the patient may have and working on clearing that airway. And then the N is like, you wanna look at the patient's neck mobility. Does the patient have any limited neck mobility? Does the patient have on a collar or anything like that? Or when you find somebody down, you don't wanna automatically just, you know, hyperextend their neck because you really don't know. So the LEMON, L-E-M-O-N, is a way of airway assessment uh, easily. Okay. So during uh, uh, management of the airway, uh, you need, uh, especially in the advanced airway management, you need to prepare the heavy equipment ready at any time for uh, airway management. So some of these are, uh, Preparation that you're going to die or do all equipment you're going to use are like uh, having an oxygen source, ambu based test mask, a laryngoscope, endotracheal tubes, uh, endotracheal uh, introducers like uh, stillage and bougie, airway devices uh, like uh, oral airway, nozzle airway, also for uh, devices. Suction machine, suction tube, or suction catheter, uh, part of the data and capnography, of course, for monitoring. 
um, blood pressure measurements, uh, ECG, having things ready for IV access, LNG, lubricants, and the drug that you're going to need during the um, manipulation of the airway or to allow you for easy airway management. So the next slide. Oh. Oxygen source. So oxygen source, sometimes you might have an oxygen cylinder, which is kept ready, just in case when you want to, to support the patient with oxygen, you all want to intubate, or you want to apply underbase, you need oxygen. Uh, next slide, in this we will pass past. Also, you need to have ample bag, uh, oxygen tubing, and oxygen test mask. Uh, next. Also, airway devices like uh, face mask, uh, LMA, and airway. The face mask is best to be a. Uh, <coughs> the, 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 the best uh, uh, face mask to have are like this, that you can see the body in the, uh, the mask. You can see if the patient is vomiting and not a colored one, which you cannot see uh, inside. Next slide. Also, things like laryngoscope to, to help you with the visualization of the of the trachea, of the vocal cords uh, during intubation, or having an air trap, or a video laryngoscope, all of them you can. Amen. And the secure tubes and introducers should be ready. So this is like an airway a crash catch or airway train. That means all of these things are available today. The next slide. So also an important part of having is like a suction, a waking suction. Uh, with the adequate vacuum effect and the suction tubes. Next slide. And also monitoring devices like spasm oximeter, if you have an ECG, capnography, it will also uh, help you to know that you are, you are successful to clear the airway, you are right in the airway track and not in the esophagus, you are oxygenating your patients well. And also things that will help you, for example, migraine process will help you to remove some of the foreign body, uh, especially in the upper air part, in the other part, or in the larynx. Uh, lubricant, so also prevent trauma, especially when you are intubating, or when you are treating a number airway. Also plasters, or if you have other means of securing your tube, it should be good. Next. So also the drugs that you are going to need, like the paralytic agents, the neuromuscular blockers, you need to have bronchodilators, uh, you need to have uh, anticholinergic, like atropine, benzopyrolate, uh, diuretic sometimes, but also hypnotic, as uh, is the patient, ketamine, propofol, midazola, analgesics like fentanyl, and local anesthetics, uh, lidocaine spray, and things like that. Next slide. And also vasopressors, uh, doing phenylephrine, and desktop. So this is like an uh, emergency airway cast or emergency crash cast that you have that will really help you whenever you have an emergency situation. You are doubt you of the patterns of the airway and the physical status of the patient. So next. So now we see the techniques for airway management. So first, we have oral and nasal airway, and these are employed in the pharyngeal obstruction with four at the time. So in the unconscious patients or the patients with anesthetized, you might first do the head lift or the thrust to relieve the airway, but you also need to put your oral or nasal airway to keep the airway patent. So this will maintain the airway passage between the tongue and posterior pharyngeal wall. And this is not best applied to a weak patient or if the patient is near very light of because they will gag, they will cough, and they will not be comfortable. Uh, next. 
So the oropharyngeal airway uh, by Guedel, also called the Guedel airway. There are sizes for infants up to adults, and the sizing is just by measuring from the face to the to the end of the jaw. And in stated, it is stated in, in upside down, up to the front, then you rotate 180, uh, rotation of 180 degrees. But in infants and children, we just have to hold the tongue back and insert airway right side up. And during removing, we just pull it, pulling it uh, with the uh, rotation. So the next slide we will see the, the greater airway of the size. And uh, not only the greater airway, we also have uh, other, uh, other types of airway, like German airway or something. Which is also aids uh, with uh, when you use a video and or you use the muscle grass, they are used as a blade uh, to support the tongue. So you could easily visualize the uh, so the parts of the airway have the branch, dental part, the tube, and the pharyngeal airway. So also, apart from oral uh, pharyngeal airway, we have a nasal part of the airway, which you also, when you want to size it, this one is from the nostril to earlobe or end of your. So you will have to lubricate in this so as to avoid a, a trauma to the nose, so the nose I live as it's easy to injure the vessel the there. So you need to lubricate it and insert in the nose until the flared part ends right on the nostril. So this again is not to be used for partial trauma or suspected trauma. So this is how you insert the oral pharyngeal. You in adult, uh, you put it in a backward way and then you rotate 180 degrees. And the nose of pharynx is that I uh, set in the nose. First, you have to measure it the size of the forest from the nostril to uh, ear lobe or end of your. And then you will set that with the French part is uh, rest on the nostril. Uh, next. One thing I would like to add about the nasal pharyngeal is that once you start. Um, insertion, if you feel any resistance at all, do not push it because you can cause bleeding. So you then go to the other side. Um, a lot of times what I do is I'll use, um, we either use cocaine or we use <coughs> epinephrine, um, a phenylephrine mixture with the uh, Lubrifax. And then you insert that way. And then that also minimizes or decreases any bleeding. But do not advance if you feel any resistance, just go to the other side. Okay, thank you, Dr. Gwen. So in pediatric, as we said, you just need to put the airway in the right, uh, in the right as it is. You are not going to put it in there, uh, <coughs> rotating rotate, rotate more, no. But if you, the tongue is the first thing, you can use the tongue depressor, and insert the airway right away the mouth. So <clears throat> this is how you put a, again, again, you will also have to measure uh, from the first incisa to the end of the jaw. And also, maybe you, you already put your airway right, and now you want to apply test mask. So the test mask is there for delivery of oxygen. And this is by making it airtight thing with the patient's face, especially the part of the mouth and the nose. The transparent test mask are encouraged because it will give you visualization of what you're doing. You can see the vomit happening. I can see the fogging in it. So it makes me easy to know that I'm doing the right if you have a transparent test mask. So the transparent test mask are encouraged not the color don or the dark one, because you will not see if the patient is vomiting in it. Next slide. I think that one of the most important things in, in establishing airway, and if you're thinking of advancing um, and having to go to a tube, is just to make sure that you can actually ventilate the patient. Take your time and see if you can ventilate the patient using either one hand technique or two, two hand technique. But if you have, if you're able to ventilate the patient 
then you have time in the, in the event that the patient, you can't intubate the patient. So maintain a tight seal. If you need help, then ask for help, that kind of thing. But just make sure that you can ventilate the patient because if you can't ventilate and you can't intubate, then the patient is DOA, dead on arrival. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and I, I'd also say, um, uh, just to notice the angle of the uh, of the face mask and how it's placed on the face, that's also very important. Yeah, Dr. Mappy's going to talk about that now. Okay, so, ahead, Dr. so we have this technique of handling a face. So like, if you see the, the, the face picture here, it's one hand technique called the C and P. Mm -hmm. So your thumb and index finger are applying pressure on the mask downward to make a tight fit. Meanwhile, uh, the middle finger, the ring finger, and the pink finger, or the little finger, we are resting in the, uh, the pink finger and of jaw and the lower jaw to make an upward thrust. Okay? Like you are doing jaw thrust, uh, upward uh, thrust to keep the airway more open. So if you, you oxygenate the patient or you malibate you you your patient, the air gets in. And the most important part here is for you to be successful. You will observe or you will feel the resistance of uh, a baby or you will not have a response to uh, abnormal. You don't have the chest uh, rise or chest movement then you will know that I had to do something to keep the airway open. So the very first maneuver to do is the correct handling of that. Uh, the next slide. So, we, we, so all of these maneuvers, they are not advised in a cervical spine pathology. So if you have a patient with cervical spine injured, you have to keep the head in neutral position and stabilize the neck. So you will not do the jaw thrust, you will not do the chin lift because you will be hurting more the patient. And if you have an obese patient, you also encourage you to use the 30 degree upward run. So the best position is the sniffing position, whereby the pharyngeal axis, laryngeal axis, and the oral, uh, uh, oral, oral axis, they align themselves to keep the airway patent. But if you fail to put the patient in this uh, position, the patient will have obstruction from dawn to sound by obstructing the pharyngeal part. So if you have a very obese patient, you might also add a ramp to make an inclination of 30 degrees so as to release the obstruction and the evenness of the patient. So uh, another technique of uh, bed and mask ventilation by two-handed technique. Uh, the next slide. Now here you need an assistant uh, to apply a, a, a bed or to vent for you. Uh, next, uh, and this uh, is now it shows that you make a guest side mask with the patient's airway, the left hand mask, and you are venting or you are providing positive pressure ventilation with the right hand. Now the thumb and the index, they apply the downward pressure. Middle finger and the ring finger, they are doing extension of the jaw. And the little finger is helping you with the jaw uh, lift so as to, to keep the airway open. Uh, next slide. And next slide now, I'm going to talk about the two hand technique. Now here, someone is applying positive pressure vegetation for you, but you use your two hands to hold the mask. And on those two hands, the thumb apply downward pressure. The fingertips displace the jaw forward. And here, but here you also have to look uh, to avoid the eye injury, especially if the mask is too big, uh, taking the space from the mouth up to the eye. You should avoid the eye injury by choosing the mask. So that is two hand technique. But someone has to help you to, to prevent or to apply the positive pressure. Another way of uh, securing airway or managing airway is the use of laryngeal mask airway. 
So this is one of the supraglottic divides placed above the glottis. And this also is used for unconscious or anesthetized patients. In the awake patients, they will not be comfortable, they will cough and they will gasp and sometimes laryngospharax. So this channel the oxygen to the lung by just applying it in the glottic area to allow the air to pass through the <laughs> And also, it should not be used in high risk, in patients with high risk of respiration because by the structure, the tip, uh, the pressure that is going to fill the esophageal uh, opening. So if you have a very uh, a patient with high risk of aspiration, like the patients you have on the patients that has consumed the meal, or you have a full stomach patient, or you have a patient with huge abdominal dysfunction, it's not used uh, for high risk because it has a risk of aspiration. Next uh, slide. Uh, in next slide, we see the, the, the part of the LMA and the insertion technique for ventilation equipment. In which part? In here, you will connect with the breathing circuit. You have a part which is, the patient's teeth will bite, and this part is very strong to avoid uh, uh, to avoid that you will bite until you touch the, the, the item. And also, the, the part which we left on the blood area, and this is non inflatable cup, uh, the eye gel, we also have inflatable uh, laryngeal mask, in which you can inflate with air to make a tight fit to the blood. And also, the, the drain tube that you can drain if you have patients or you have other things. So, again, the patient has to be unconscious or anesthetized. You choose the correct size, a sterilized uh, laryngeal mask, and you have, if, if it is an inflatable one, you have to test the, to inflate and deflate the cap before you apply it. Again, lubrication will help you, and you will grip it like a pen and move through the mouth to the throat. So the tip will stick against the esophagus and the ball of face of the vocal cord. And then you will set the cup if it is set up a cup. If it's not set up, monitor it. Uh, next slide. The one thing I'd like to add to this is if you're, when you're lubricating the tip, you just want to lubricate the tip and you want to make sure that the um, lubricant doesn't go inside so that the patient doesn't aspirate it. So some people put a lot in but it's unnecessary just the tip is you know necessary to lubricate and then um, that's enough by body weight so you, you take the patient's weight and like, for example the patient is uh between eight and let's say eight kilogram i would choose 1.5 size whether you have an ij type or a classical ma with the place in sensible uh, cuff the weight of the patients will guide you, like this in this table. So this table has a recommended size of laryngeal mass airway according to the patient's body weight. So myself, I'm a, I will have number number five. Doctor Gwen? Yes. What's your size according to body weight? Uh, four. Usually, a four is the go-to size for most people. Um, and if the patient's small, you usually go with the three. But four, number four is the usual standard size. So most of, most of, the, of the, the people will have number four. Mm. Okay. Uh, next slide. So another, another airway management technique is the trachea intubation. Now here we will simply a placement of a flexible plastic tube to the trachea to maintain an open air. And this will facilitate oxygenation and ventilation. This is invasive, hence it's also performed in unconscious fashion, relaxed fashion, because the vocal cords uh, will be uh, preventing you from inserting the tube because they reject the tube as a foreign body. 
So you need to relax the patient to paralyze the condition. Now, in awake fashion, you will need a local or a topical uh, spray to the local cord and the structure uh, around towards to paralyze them. Yeah, so they could not uh, be uh, applying causing fuzzy when you uh, want to put a tube. So among all the things that uh, are in the station of the uh, on the place, next time we will see. That when you want to do to do trachea intubation with a direct laryngoscope. First of all, this is done in a routine emergency situation, and when you have a difficult air. And among the contraindication is uh, if you, the patient is hypoxic at the time, you will need to perform big and mass ventilation with tea. And if you have a limited mouth opening, like we saw the mouth opening, you have an upper area distortion or swelling, you have an extreme car car coverage of the upper bulb, copious blood and secretion, you need to start to And the complications that might rise are like hypoxic brain injury due to hypoxia, cardiac array, aspiration, upper airway trauma from the instrumentation, and also the endoscope. So among the things that you need, you need to have a suction ready, you need to have a waking laryngoscope, you need to have a baby valve mask, a nozzle, an oral airway. You also need to have a carbon dioxide detector so as to assure you that I'm the right uh, uh, side where I put my tube. And the other thing that we, we, we allow you. Again, why do you want to do this? The correct position for making a very laryngoscopic intubation, it's a sniffing position. And we saw in there, the last slide, putting a patient in a sniffing position. If the patient is obeyed, you will need a small connection of the city, about the center degree around, so as to make a range of the patient's needs. Next, next slide. I'm I'm just curious to find out uh, for my ICU and um, anesthesia colleagues and other people who are covering their hospitals, how many of you have a difficult airway cart already made up and in place? Just put it in the chat if you do. First position for inflation, uh, position. And uh, in the next slide, we'll see how you take uh, the laryngoscope with the traction on the laryngoscope aimed towards the junction of opposite floor of the stadium. So the tip of the blade will be in the balletra, and the tip of the blade leads the diglossic direct. Also, this will help you to avoid, uh, to avoid the dental trauma if you try to rest uh, the, the laryngoscope. Now we will see the, the, the YouTube video which will show us to the video we show laryngoscope yeah. and incubation. So now they are trying to do the, the, the tip of the blade now is in the palestra and they just apply the lifting the epigotic upward to get good visualization of the vocal cord. And if you saw the vocal cord, you will take the tube. Soon after you take the tube, you need to inflate the tube. For us to prevent other things like the creation to go to the airway. Now, upon intubation, you will have to observe and listen. You have to observe the chest movement and listen for uh, uh, air entry on the both lungs. Thereafter, you are sure I'm in the right position. Of course, the capnography will also help you. And you will secure the tube so that it will not be retracted or. Push the more down. To add, and I tell my students, and I'm really a stickler about, is you always want to protect the eyes. So before you think of placing a, a tube, you cover the patient's eyes, you put tape on the eyes, and you secure the eyes prior to. Sometimes you get real distracted trying to hurry up and intubate, and then the patient basically has an eye injury. So number one, make sure you cover the eyes with tape. First.
Okay, always protect the eyes. Yes. Uh, Faringeal structures and then laryngeal structures. So this is best done by you to hold your laryngoscopy use uh, your left hand and your right hand is the expression by holding the tube. So now you try as much as possible to, to push the tongue on the left side so as to get a good visualization of the laryngeal structure. And once you see you start to see the laryngeal structure, the, one of the good landmarks is to see the epiglottis. So if you see the epiglottis, as we say, the epiglottis cover the glottis. So below that structure is where you can find your vocal cords. So like in the picture C, now we can appreciate the vocal cords, the whitish strip that we see, and we want to put our tube just in, in that place that we are going to insert it. Now here, an assistant may help you to insert the tube laterally, so as to have a good visualization. And uh, as we said uh, during the range review, uh, next slide, you can also grade your view. If you, if you have a good visualization of the focal cords, now it's grade, grade one. Oh, you can see it like it goes two. Oh, I can only see the epiglottis. I can't see the focal cords. Oh, I cannot see epiglottis nor the focal cords. So it's sometimes helpful to document uh, this uh, uh, laryngeal review grade, especially when we have, you have a difficult one. So the next time the patient is uh, coming for anesthesia or for emergency, they know that we are going to face this cartel in the patient. And uh, sometimes you need to do external laryngeal manipulation to get a better view of the laryngeal structure. So you hold the laryngoscopy instance, but you are not getting a good view. So, so you can, someone might, you can also use your hand to manipulate the larynx externally and ask an assistant to hold or to apply pressure uh, so as you can get the good laryngeal view. So another, another method of securing airway is uh, by surgical method or surgical airway. And this now uh, you can do precocyrotomy or tracheostomy. And in which you can do Pakistanian or Pakistanian or using a needle. And in tracheostomy again, you can use Pakistanian or Pakistanian. So most of the time, this is done in a situation where I have a discharge airway. I try to, to present the patient by a mask and I stay. I try to intubate the patient and I stay. So the last option is surgical airway, also called a Pona. Pona is a front of neck airway. So you need uh, to bypass uh, the intubation part of the laryngoscope and you go direct to the front of the neck where you will have access to the trachea. So the next slide. Now this is like a plan B in the dust guideline of 2016 whereby now we have to do the emergency front of neck access because we can't intubate and we can't optimize. So you do some attempts to manage the airway by trachea intubation, face mask ventilation, and the supergotic airway devices, but all have stage. So to prevent hypoxic brain damage and death to the patient, I have to do front of neck access, again, airway access. And as we say, uh, two types are uh, precocytomy and tracheostomy. Uh, so starting with our uh, precocytomy, as in short, uh, when you have this uh, <coughs> problem, next slide. So we need to, to identify the cryptothyroid membrane <coughs> of the patient. You do a sub PC using a bulge and a tube technique. So you, 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 you take a, a, a scaffold and a stab, 
you use the area to allow a bougie to enter. You first use the bougie uh, to guide you to the, to the trachea, and then you will you will do the endovascular tube to insert the bougie, which will lead you directly to there. Uh, uh, to care. But the most important part is safety to identify the fetal thyroid root membrane, where it's safe to start and to make a cut. And if you make a cut with your scapel, you will need to rotate the scapel so that the sharp edges will point powder that leads down. So this technique will also give you a hint of pulling the scapel too much you so as to open the incision and the slide it up. But you will need to insert a, a bougie face. And sometimes you can use a jet ventilation whereby you can apply uh, oxygen source so as to obstinate the patient immediately. So you get there, here we are. So the next slide will show us that upon insertion of the bougie, now we are coming to put that in the okay, tube to eat. So now, we really roll the endovascular tube over the bougie into the trachea. And soon if the trachea is in, you remove the bougie and connect the patient to the, uh, the breathing tactic or ambulate and start to revenge. So as to prevent the death or brain damage. So that was triple thyroidotomy. And also we have a tracheotomy, which and uh, uh, emergence uh, condition we need to apply, whereby now here we make a small cut like you see in the A, and we will we, we cut the skin to get a view of the, of the trachea. And sometimes they do testing of to aspirate the air, so to be sure that this uh, I'm in the right side of the and the right side, which is the trachea. So if you aspirate air, you are in the trachea. So you insert again, you can also put an endotracheal tube direct <coughs> into the tracheostomy opening, or you can use a tracheostomy tube to put and connect the patient to the ambo bag, or as seen in the next picture, where they use the tracheostomy tube, which is also something you can connect direct, or you can apply a small size of endotracheal tube and it starts to ventilate or to oxidize the patient. So these surgical methods uh, mark the end of the presentation. Uh, the next slide is for questions, uh, references, and, uh, and I thank you for listening. So this is how the, the tracheostomy tube appears inside the, the trachea, and also the patient connected and secured well. So uh, thank you all for listening to this, uh, the last slide. Now we welcome for questions. Um, so anything, Dr. Gwen, before I start asking questions? Um, no, I just wanted to find out uh, about the air emergency airway cart. Um, every facility really should have one. And if you don't, then I'm hoping that the people on this um, airway management uh, webinar will go back and look at developing one because you should have all of the devices necessary when intubation is immediate and necessary. So my question is how many of the participants here actually have a difficult airway cart? Let's get back. Uh, Yes. Yes. Hello. 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 We hear you. Yeah, I, I, I want to, to I want to add in the, the some kind of indication to the 
building mask, building new ammo bag. There are some kind of patient to have more bears. Uh, so it is make yeah. some difficulty building bag. So you don't use more force to bag in during the patient with uh, more and dev. It is some kind of block the, the humble bag. We cannot succeed. So it is contraindication to do humble bag for the patient with and dev. What did he say? Yeah. It's impossible. It's impossible to do an ambu bag with some patients. Okay, so if the patient has a lot, has a lot of beer, uh -huh. especially oh, yeah. men, yes, yes, it's very difficult yeah. to apply the face mask. So sometimes right. they don't, you, you cannot achieve a tight seal. Uh -huh. So you will have some air escaping around because uh, the, the mask cannot make a tight seal. But you have the to use, right, but you have to use a two-handed technique for patients that are heavily bearded. It has to be a two-hand technique. Two hands on the mask, another person squeezing the bag. You cannot do both at the same time. Okay, so to achieve a tight seal of the mask. Right. Of a face mask. Yes. Okay, thank you. Dr. Moshi from Bukoba. Uh, a regional hospital. Another one mm -hmm. with patients. Tafik uh, Khalifa says most of the time are available but not in the cart. Uh, so, so uh, what the... so if they are not in the cart, where are they? Yes, where are they? Can you respond? Humble bag somewhere else. Uh -huh. okay, it's used somewhere else. Mm. So they need to, to, to same cut. Yeah. So to to week Khalifa, um, you need as you know now that you can't have everything everywhere. So now it becomes incumbent upon you to go back to your unit and develop an airway box. If you're not going to have a total cart then you should always have all of your airway equipment in one location in some kind of tackle box or something rather than respiratory difficulty, then that's not the time to search for equipment readily available. So now I'm tasking you. Thank you. I'm glad you're going to implement. What hospital are you? I will come and check on you when I get there. <laughs> Tafik, Tafik, Kaka Tafik, uh, where are you? Every unit, whether it's on the floor or the ICU, especially, you know, and anesthesia, you should always have a travel box or you should have a box, emergency airway box readily available for yeah, all the participants all on this uh, presentation. And also another thing important is to do a routine checklist that everything is there. When you enter the shift in the morning, you have to check that everything is there. If you use something, you have to replace. Thank you for Dr. Mape. And uh, as a colleague, uh, I, I'm very happy if it is another session. Thank you. Okay, you can also, Dr. George, you can also suggest uh, the topic for the next time session to be uh, prepared. Mm -hmm. So yeah. for me, I, I think the good, the, the next may be for use for ventilating machine, means that the, for the portable ventilator machine which you use in ICU. Mm hmm Okay. If you have any other suggestions for presentations, please let let us know. Um, QHSC no, or you know myself or Dr. Mappy, and we will be more than happy to provide further training. 
Thank you again, Dr. Mappe and Dr. Randall for um, hosting this presentation. Yeah. It was very nice. Thank you. There's no we further appreciate it. questions. Yes, that was an excellent presentation there, yeah. Dr. Adis. Dr. Adis, how, can I say doctors plural? <laughs> or comments, then thank you for your participation and we'll look forward to seeing you on another session in um, actually May. Okay. Asante sana. Thank you guys.